For most heroes, their primary attribute is an incidental consideration. Sometimes it's little more than flavor. For Drow Ranger, agility is the current that breathes life into her. Empowered by it, she crashes through the map, hunting for her next target. Or is she running, hiding from other predators? Drow Ranger echoes through Dota history as the namesake for an entire playstyle. But this poses an important question. Were Drow Ranger and Drow Strats actually any good? Today we will delve into Dota history and deconstruct her story and performance at the most important Dota 2 events, the International Tournament Series. So, how good was Traxx, the Drow Ranger? Each Stories of Dota video takes hundreds of hours to produce. Because of this, our channel is only possible through the help of generous sponsors. The Story of Drow Ranger is sponsored by the popular mobile game Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is reminiscent of the old school style of turn-based RPGs. You have a team of champions that you use to take on missions. Each of them has unique abilities that you need to use intelligently to fight free rounds of increasingly difficult enemies. The trick here is managing your resources and cooldowns smartly to ensure that you don't get overwhelmed in the last wave. You see me lose a mission here, and my mistake was that I used all of my abilities right away and then ran out of options when I needed them. I tried the mission again, and this time I played more patiently and strategized better around my heavy hitters, and I managed to win without needing any upgrades to my units. As Raid is an RPG, I could also have gone and tried to get a new piece of equipment or some additional levels on my units instead. You've got a variety of options on how you want to approach the game. Raid Shadow Legends is a good game to play on a day-by-day -day basis. Planning and experiencing the long-term development of your team can be quite fun and rewarding. There are also frequent updates like the recent addition of the Hydra Clash clan-based competition. If you want to try out Raid Shadow Legends, you can do so by clicking on the link in the description or scanning the QR code on the screen. If you do so, you also get some bonuses like the Epic Champion Knight Errant that will help you get started nice and quickly. Please do actually check them out, without sponsors like Raid, channels like ours wouldn't be possible. Thank you very much to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video, and now, let's get started. Drow Ranger was added into Dota 2 during the close beta period before the first international. She was a ranged agility hero. At the time of her implementation, her attributes were horrible, across the board among the lowest in the entire game. The most noteworthy thing about her was her unusually high attack range of 625. She also had a weirdly high night vision range. All of her abilities were very simple. Her first ability was Frost Arrows. Frost Arrows allowed her to apply a slowing effect to her attacks, which cost a small bit of mana whenever used. This had no cooldown and wasn't really a spell, but instead a modifier of her attacks and could only be applied when Drow Ranger attacked a target. There were a lot of spells and items that had similar effects, and they were usually grouped into a class called Unique Attack Modifiers. I think we already understand why they were called Attack Modifiers, but they were unique, because only one of them could be used at a time. This meant that Drow Ranger couldn't use Frost Arrows at the same time that she was using a different Unique Attack Modifier. Unfortunately, there were a lot of powerful items that were also classified as unique attack modifiers. Among those were Lifesteal, Eye of Skadi, Desolator and Mana Break. If Drow Ranger wanted to use any of those items, she had to make concessions. Specifically, she had to use Frost Arrows only at carefully considered moments, as otherwise Frost Arrows would override the other unique attack modifier she was using. This immediately limited her scope of item builds severely. However, Frost Arrows had another unique property that gave them significant value. To use Frost Arrows, Drow Ranger could either right-click the ability to make it apply to all of her attacks automatically, or she could manually cast the ability by clicking Q and then on an enemy hero, which would then cause her to attack her target. The difference between the two methods was that the first counted as attacking, while the second as casting a spell. 
This was relevant for creeps and towers, which would aggro to attack nearby opposing heroes that attacked one of their allied heroes. But they would not do the same to opponents that cast a spell on one of their allies. If Drow Ranger attacked an opposing hero using the manual method of casting frost arrows, it would count as a spell and not an attack. And as such, it would never pull creep aggro, which allowed her complete freedom to harass her opponents. This strategy was also commonly called orb walking. Unfortunately, due to her horrendous stats, specifically her incredibly low intelligence, she would quickly run out of mana when using frost arrows, minimizing her opportunities to actually use the ability. Her second ability was silence. Silence applied a silence in a small AoE, silencing any target hit by silence for a few seconds. Her third ability was Precision Aura. Precision Aura provided all allied ranged units in a 900 radius around Draw Ranger with a percentage increase to their attack damage. This bonus was calculated using base damage, which is only the damage provided by starting damage and primary attributes. A simple way of figuring out what is base damage and what isn't is to check the white and green number on a Dota hero's damage. White is base damage and green is bonus damage. Only base damage was modified by Precision Aura. As you might already have guessed, Drow Ranger's base damage in the early game was quite low, so Precision Aura offered very little damage. Finally, Drow Ranger's ultimate was Marksmanship. Marksmanship gave Drow passive bonus agility. That's it. That's the whole ultimate. Keep in mind that Drow Ranger had terrible agility gain and starting agility, which meant that all marksmanship was doing was making up for her lackluster natural attributes. If we compare her to a similar hero at the time, Klinks, we can see that Klinks had the same starting agility and 3.0 agility gain compared to Drow Ranger's 1.9. This meant that if we account for Drow Ranger's missing natural agility, Marksmanship effectively gave less than 10 agility per ability level, which simply wasn't good. During the time of her first implementation, Drow Ranger was a relic of the past. Most of her abilities were literally copy-pasted from Warcraft 3 heroes. Frost arrows came from Naga Siewicz, Silence from Dark Ranger, and Precision Aura from Priestess of the Moon. Marksmanship was her only original ability, and in my opinion calling it original is quite generous. At the first international, Drow Ranger was only played twice. To explain why, I could give you a big long analysis of what the meta was like in 2011 and how Drow Ranger didn't fit into it, and while that would be accurate, it ultimately wasn't the main problem. That was that Drow Ranger was just terrible. In both her games, she took on the role of a position 1 safe lane carry. Her long range coupled with orb walking made her a reasonable laner that could apply a decent amount of pressure by herself. Particularly as she hit level 6, her attack damage jumped up a good bit and gave her a brief window of complete control over the lane. This allowed her tri-lane supports to play more actively around the map, since she didn't need as much help. However, as soon as the early laning stage was over, the cracks started to show. Since Drow Ranger's only slow needed to be applied through an attack, she couldn't use it defensively, which meant she had no good way of defending herself from ganks. While she could use her silence to delay attackers from casting their spells, casting the ability required her to stand still giving her opponents more time to get close to her. And as soon as somebody managed to close the distance, she was as good as dead. Fast heroes like Viva, Darkseer and Nightstalker had no problems hunting her down. That by itself wouldn't be too bad, as there were various heroes that were weak defensively, but brought enough power to the table to be worth picking anyway. Drow Ranger had two abilities fully dedicated to damage. Both Precision Aura and Marksmanship amounted to a simple damage boost and offered no additional utility. This might make you expect that Drow Ranger was one of those high risk, high DPS heroes. Unfortunately, her numbers were too low and her abilities were too basic. Even when given the opportunity to land multiple attacks, she couldn't do any damage. 
Combine that with the fact that she didn't have an inbuilt farming tool and no naturally good items as Frosteros pushed her away from unique attack modifiers and you can see why the hero was underwhelming and performed very poorly. When she was picked, she was paired with other ranged heroes that could benefit from her damage boosting aura. Other aura heroes like Ventral Spirit and Beastmaster also allowed for aura stacking synergy, although Drow Ranger's aura was decidedly the worst of the bunch. Her most valuable asset was her long attack range, which allowed her to find opportunities other carries wouldn't be able to use, but that by itself wasn't enough to justify picking her. Drow Ranger lost both games that she saw play in, and honestly, her team was playing 4 vs 5. It was a common joke at the time that she was a ranged creep that could buy items. I find it hard to disagree with this assessment. After the International 1, Drow Ranger had her base agility increased by 4 and silence radius by 25. This obviously didn't address any of the issues the hero had and was a laughably minimal set of buffs for a hero that needed a lot of help. As a result, she saw no play at the International 2. In the first patch after TI2, Drow Ranger had all of her abilities significantly buffed. Then a month later, Precision Aura and Marksmanship were reworked. Marksmanship had its agility bonus adjusted and gained a new property that doubled the agility bonus when no enemy heroes were in a 375 radius around Drow Ranger. 375 radius was quite big, but due to Drow Ranger's naturally long attack range, keeping that kind of distance was possible. When the bonus was active, Drow Ranger gained 40 agility at level 6, which was huge. While she strictly speaking still didn't have a farming ability, 40 agility might as well be one because of the sheer attack damage and attack speed it provided. It's noteworthy here that the marksmanship bonus agility did not apply to illusions, which unfortunately limited her item choices as Manta Star wasn't as good as it could have been. Precision Aura also received an important rework. It now provided a percentage of Drow Ranger's agility as bonus damage to all allied ranged heroes on the map. This effect applied globally, providing all allied ranged heroes with unconditional bonus damage which was incredibly powerful, especially during the laning stage. The first iteration of the new Precision Aura could also be toggled at no cost with no cooldown to affect all allied creeps globally. But this wasn't something she would want to do during the laning stage, as it made controlling the lane difficult. After that point, it allowed Drow Ranger to apply an unprecedented amount of global map pressure that most teams couldn't handle. This toggle was quickly removed and replaced with an additional passive component that applied the aura to allied ranged creeps in a 900 radius. After her reworks, Drow Ranger was quite powerful and so she immediately got nerfed. Her base armor was reduced by 2, making her vulnerable to physical attacks before she hit level 6. Additionally, her marksmanship was changed to no longer provide bonus agility at all when an enemy hero was nearby. This meant that the previous armor reduction change really hurt, since if an opponent managed to disable her ultimate, she was, frankly, a free kill. In an almost sadistic moment, Valve buffed Precision Aura's damage by 2% and then sent Drow Ranger into TI3. Unlike before, this time she at least had some theoretical merit, as Precision Aura was a unique ability that would have been worth considering if only the rest of the hero hadn't been a wet paper towel with anxiety issues. As soon as an opponent got close to Drow Ranger, she was sent to the scrapyard and so she saw no play at the International Free. 6.79 buff Precision Aura's damage. It also replaced the 900 radius creep damage aura with an active component that had a 2 minute cooldown and could be used to make the ability globally affect creeps for the next 30 seconds. This was very powerful as it allowed Drow Ranger to apply global pushing pressure without needing to do anything other than click a button. Precision Aura was a great ability now. Unfortunately, 
Drow Ranger also received some nerfs. Marksmanship had its attribute negation AoE increased to 400 and Drow Ranger's night vision was reduced to the usual 800. A few months later, silence was replaced with Gust. Gust released a wave into the targeted direction which pushed all opponents hit by it away from Drow Ranger and applied a silence to them. The knockback effect from Gust was more powerful the closer any given opponent was to Drow Ranger. This finally offered her a way to defend herself. While it wasn't the most powerful get off me tool, at least it was a get off me tool. Drow Ranger really started with nothing, so any improvement will go a long way. With these new tools, Drow Ranger finally saw some play at the International 2014. Drow Ranger was used by one team and one player only. Cloud9's Eternal Envy. They always constructed their entire draft around synergizing with Drow Ranger as their position 1 carry. This meant they always picked at least 4 ranged heroes and specifically always Visage. Visage had an ultimate that summoned 2 familiars that had flying movement, rapid attack speed and could be controlled freely. Most importantly, these summons were Creep Heroes a unique classification that only applied to a very small selection of units. This classification was crucial because it meant that as far as Precision Aura was concerned, the familiars were treated as heroes and since they were ranged they could unconditionally benefit from the bonus damage Drow Ranger provided to her team. Visage effectively acted as free heroes as far as Drow Ranger was concerned. 4 after Visage bought Aghanim Scepter, which allowed him to summon an additional familiar. But the familiars were actually even better than just that. As already mentioned, they had flying movement and incredible attack speed. This was usually balanced by their damage being fairly low and conditional. However, Drow Ranger completely changed that dynamic by giving them a flat damage boost which made them a deadly global presence that could easily push creep waves and take towers by themselves. In teamfights, familiars could quickly pick off supports in the backline and generally provided tremendous damage. Setting that aside, Precision Aura was an incredible ability at all stages of the game. Eternal Enemy always leveled it first, giving all ranged heroes on his team 6 extra attack damage right away. 6 extra attack damage may not sound like that much, but it genuinely changed how the entire laning stage played out. Last hitting became trivial. Heroes that stood no chance in certain matchups could now actually win them and supports harassing became an absolute nightmare to deal with. As the game continued and Drow Ranger gained access to her ultimate and some items, the potency of Precision Aura exploded. With level 3 marksmanship, she easily provided her team with at least 60 additional damage each and this continued to scale as she became more powerful. Having Drow Ranger on your team meant that every ranged hero became a physical DPS. This could be used in an endless variety of different ways. Cloud9 always took early and frequent Roshans as it was easy to do so with Drow Ranger and Visage. If they took an early lead, they pushed rapidly, breaking down towers and barracks in seconds. Heroes like Nature's Prophet and Wind Ranger could focus their item set entirely around offensive and defensive utility, as Precision Aura gave them all the damage they needed. Drow Ranger could also function as an effective storing hero. If she spammed the active component of her aura to temporarily enhance the damage of all allied ranged creeps, then she was able to apply significant map pressure and keep her lanes pushed without ever needing to show herself in a lane, which made aggressive plays much more difficult for her opponents. If not dealt with, this could even result in large stacks of ranged creeps accumulating in a lane and dealing significant building damage, even going as far as destroying barracks entirely on their own. Time was always in Drow Ranger's favor as the constant map pressure would inevitably add up. A creep hitting a tower might not usually do a lot of damage, but with Drow Ranger, they did. Despite all of her strengths, Drow Ranger also had a debilitating flaw 
that unfortunately precluded her from large-scale tournament success. If anybody ever got close to her, she was dead. And no draw ranger also meant no precision aura. The aura died with the hero. And the hero had no way to defend herself. As a defensive ability, Gust wasn't anywhere near enough. Due to her aforementioned merits, Drow Ranger was a high priority target and always hunted in fights. In fact, she spent most of her time in fights running away, only rarely getting a chance to attack. Dying early in fights was such a big problem that in their longer matches, Eternal Enemy stopped buying items and instead prioritized saving for buyback for every death. That way, he could continue providing the aura even if killed. But obviously, this wasn't the kind of gameplay most teams were hoping for from their main carry. Drow Ranger's lackluster defenses plagued her from the beginning of every game to the end. Her laning stage was weak, not because she couldn't apply pressure, but because any misstep meant her death. To try to counteract this, she was usually given whichever was the most survivable lane, whether that be the safe lane or the mid. The goal wasn't to get farmed quickly, but to reach level 6 with as few deaths as possible. Eternal Envy laned against Razor mid twice and he got destroyed both times. However, while Razor could win the lane easily, he had a hard time killing Drow, which allowed her to get a reasonably fast level 6. As soon as she reached level 6, Marksmanship gave her enormous bonus agility, which in turn meant Precision Aura got a huge damage boost. Using this, she could quickly and safely clear the jungle to catch up and farm. Since survival was most important, Eternal Envy didn't feel like he could prioritize the purely offensive Precision Aura first in his skill build, and instead leveled up Frost Arrows, using level 4 to get a point into Gust. Precision Aura was chosen second, but this meant that Drow Ranger needed quite a few levels to properly come online. That's why his item build always started with Power Treads into an early Hand of Midas, which allowed him to maximize his experience gain and guaranteed a baseline level of farm. From here, he always went for Yasha to gain a bit of bonus movement speed and agility into the ultimate defensive item, BKB. Afterwards, he continued building stat-based items like Butterfly, Ioscadi, and Manta Star. Each provided Drow Ranger with additional agility, which would enhance Precision Aura even further. This made sense from an item skill build synergy point of view, but more often than not, it also meant that Drow Ranger ended up with an inventory full of attacking-based items that she couldn't use since she was spending all her time in teamfights running away. It was an item build designed to use good opportunities, which were unfortunately rare. At the International 4, Drow Ranger entered the competitive Dota 2 scene. She brought along a unique playstyle that was incredibly powerful when it worked, but her fragility made it too unreliable a strategy to garner mainstream success. Nonetheless, the one team that risked playing Drow Ranger was handsomely rewarded. They won every game they played the hero in and even earned enough respect from other teams that Drow Ranger saw a few bans. Overall, she participated in 8 games, a solid step up from the previous years. After the International 4 concluded, Drow Ranger saw only a few but quite important changes. First, Frost Arrows had its slow buffed at early levels. Then, Illusions became able to benefit from Marksmanship. Manta Star suddenly became a much more powerful item on the hero than it had already been, which was definitely a blessing. Finally, Precision Aura no longer applied to creep heroes as if they were heroes, and instead as if they were creeps. This meant that Visage's familiars would now only benefit from Precision Aura during the active period. Visage and Drow were still a strong pair, but nowhere near the power level they had been before. While this was a significant nerf to Drow Ranger, it was also well deserved, as the ease of the combo would almost certainly have proven problematic in the future.
TI-5 remained much the same. Drow Ranger still contributed huge amounts of damage to her team, and she still had a panic attack whenever anyone crossed into her 400 units of personal space. This became particularly problematic because the top 4 heroes of the International 5 were Gyrocopter, Lashrak, Queen of Pain and Tusk. All of them either wanted to close the gap anyway or had an incredibly easy time doing so. But even when those heroes weren't involved, Drow Ranger still struggled at any stage of the game. When IG played Drow against Cloud9, she was literally just hiding during the laning stage because she couldn't compete with Shadowfiend and even the mildest ganks. In a different game, LGD exploited Drow's defensive weakness by taking a super early bottom tier 1 tower, which left Drow without a safe space to farm and effectively shut her out of the entire game. She finished with a score of 0 to 11. In fights, Drow Ranger continued to spend most of her time running away, and even if she found an opportunity to attack, her positioning was easily ruined by someone blinking at her. However, Despite all of her shortcomings, there was no arguing about her potential. The damage she provided a team of ranged heroes was unmatched and continued to make her worth considering. She was picked in 3 games and banned twice. A hero grasping at viability, but ever so slightly coming short. To help address this, Valve mildly buffed Precision Aura's damage and reduced its cooldown shortly after TI-5. Then they added an Aghanim Scepter effect for Drow Ranger that gave Marksmanship a new property. After purchasing it, Drow Ranger's attacks would now splinter onto two additional enemies after they connected with their original target. The new targets would be chosen randomly among units in a 375 radius around the original target and the splintered attacks would only deal 50% of the original attack's damage, but they could proc all of its attack modifiers. This last element was a fairly unique property, as our multi-target attacks like Flak Cannon or Split Shot could only trigger attack modifiers on the original target. Her Aghanim Scepter upgrade offered a significant increase to Drow Ranger's farming speed, and it could be combined with Maelstrom for a frankly absurd farming tempo. Frost Arrows, Gust and Drow Ranger's turn rate were also slightly buffed. However, none of the things we just talked about mattered all that much, when compared to the gifts bestowed upon Drow Ranger in patches 6.86 and 6.87. 6.86 brought Dragonlance to Dota 2. Dragonlance was initially built using an Ogre Club and a Quarter Staff, but this version was quickly changed in 6.87 and 6.88, so let's talk about that iteration instead. Dragonlance was built using an Ogre Club and two bands of Elven Skin. It provided 14 Strength, 14 Agility, and 140 bonus attack range to ranged heroes. This item was tailor made for Drow Ranger. It provided the exact stats she needed, giving her a good chunk of extra health and significant agility for Precision Aura, as well as crucially providing her with additional range to stay safe in fights. After buying Dragonlance, Drow Ranger had a much easier time keeping her distance and actually getting attacks in. She could also outrange towers, which made her exceptionally good at sieging down buildings, as she never had to worry about taking damage from them. Dragonlance was also a fairly cheap item, which made it easy to fit into build paths. I would say that Dragonlance was the perfect item for Drow Ranger, but I know that isn't true, because 6.87 added Hurricane Pike, which was the perfect item for Drow Ranger. 6.88 even buffed the item slightly, so we'll talk about that version. Hurricane Pike was built using Dragonlance and Force Staff. It provided the stats of both items and it could be used to push yourself or allies forward, just like a force star. But it had some added functionality when used on opponents. If Hurricane Pike was cast on an opponent, it would push both the caster and the opponent 400 units away from each other, creating a massive gap between the two units. Then it gave the caster a buff which allowed them to attack the opponent with unlimited range and 100 bonus attack speed for 4 attacks. Drow Ranger had always longed for a tool 
that allowed her to fix her positioning problems and kept her safe from opponents. Hurricane Pike was everything she had needed. Usually, Dota 2's meta is a collection of interlocking pieces. A machine made up of cogs of different potency and function. Heroes are considered good if they fit well into this machine and if they can take up a lot of space within it. We saw this in the Juggernaut video. His perception as a good or bad hero wasn't based as much on his strength as it was on his environment. When he connected nicely into the other cogs, he could get the engine moving. But when he couldn't find a good access point, he wasn't able to contribute. At the International 2016, Drow Ranger broke free. She established a separate machine. It was now possible for heroes to either be good in the larger meta or be good with Drow Ranger. Strategies that used Drow Ranger as their centerpiece came to be called Drow Strats. Drow Strats were a distinct style of gameplay that made certain sacrifices to gain enormous attack power. Precision Aura provided huge attack damage to ranged allies, but only ranged allies. This severely limited the drafting pool for Drow Strats. They usually only wanted one or, at most, two melee heroes on their team. Any more than that and Drow Ranger had nobody to power up. Additionally, Drow Strats wanted the ranged heroes they chose to be ones that could actually connect with attacks. These didn't have to be usually attack-based heroes. Examples here were Mirana, Queen of Pain or Storm Spirit, all of which often had opportunities to attack but didn't do the most damage by themselves. Drow Ranger would fix up their damage for them and now even their casual attacks hurt quite badly. Playing without melee heroes might not sound like a big deal, but melee heroes often brought powerful AoE disables and zoning tools with them, which made it difficult to pass up on them entirely. Especially because ranged heroes were usually a bit squishy, so somebody had to create space for them. Because of this, Drow strats would often fit one melee hero focused on initiating fights and protecting the ranged cast. The top choices here were Faces Void and Axe, both of which fit the need perfectly. Drow strats had existed before, but with the recent addition of Dragonlance and Hurricane Pike, Drow Ranger herself stopped being a liability, and so the style became the most powerful it had ever been. To get a better impression of how Draw Ranger strategies played out in practice, let's have a closer look at Game 1 of the upper bracket Round 1 match between MVP Phoenix and Wings Gaming. During the draft, Wings immediately revealed their hand and picked an early Draw Ranger. MVP Phoenix responded strongly to this choice. They were already known for playing hyper-aggressive team compositions. Specifically, they liked using Phantom Assassin as a high DPS carry that could involve herself in fights right away. Phantom Assassin had an incredibly easy time closing the gap to her target hero because of her Phantom Strike ability. This made her a strong choice against Drow Ranger as she had no problem getting close to her. In addition to Phantom Assassin, they picked Dauxia and Earth Spirit, two more heroes that excelled at getting close to their target. Rounding out their draft were Oracle and Invoker, both of which had access to long-range disabling tools that further emphasized their aggression. On the other side, Wings Gaming went with a collection of high-utility ranged heroes, anchored by Drow Ranger. With the draft finished, the game begins. Right away, MVP invade the Radiant Jungle and find an early kill on Drow Ranger. Then, the laning stage stays quiet for a while. Wings quickly pull ahead as they have a much easier time last hitting because of Precision Aura providing all 5 of their heroes bonus damage. In response, MVP increases their tempo. They push the top tier 1 tower early and apply ganking pressure on Drow Ranger. She is forced to play very defensively, hiding underneath her tower, unable to farm. But this is the strength of Drow Ranger. She only needs to be alive for her team to benefit from Precision Aura. At this point, she's barely level 7 and only has a Ring of Aquila and Power Treads. Precision Aura won't even be maxed out until level 8, as Shadow opted to get an additional early point into Frost Arrows. 
Despite that, she already provides her team with 31 bonus damage each. Queen of Pain takes down the tier 1 mid by herself, then Minx groups up the rest of the team and pushes the mid tier 2. MVP know they can't defend as Minx simply do too much damage and they surrender the tower. Shutting down Drow Ranger was meant to be an aggressive, momentum gaining play but instead resulted in them losing substantial map control. Staying composed, MVP continued playing aggressively, hunting for kills and opportunities, but Vinx denies them every opening and in the meantime Drow Ranger continues farming. Eventually the Dyer settles for attempting Roshan. He wants to go on Blake with the Shadow Word and another Stifling Dagger crit coming out from QO. They have relocate. Remember, Wings effectively have five heroes here. Faith Beyond John said that's pretty deep. They can't really punish it, not yet, anyways. Dubu going instead on Ice Ice. There's the Magnetize, the Silence up on Blake as well. Tornado will clip Ice Ice. They have the Chaotic Offering. Will they get it off in time? Yes. Doesn't hit anybody though. No real disables coming out in Ice Ice solo. The Magnetize not bringing him down, but Dubu lays it or gets laid into by Shadow, but QO. Goes for the work. Sonic Wave coming in. Clips onto two. Neck back up. MVP running everyone over. And Blake might be next. Four dead. And it's a double kill. They're coming just, up. Even though Wings had five, it didn't feel like it, Mott. Faith Beyond 2 might oh, go down. Wow. A tornado from FP. There's the fairy fire, though. Faith Beyond trying to man up. And the goal of gets the double kill. Wings it. Wings built the team without any frontline. And it showed. As soon as MVP broke through their defense, the Drow Strat collapsed. MVP finish Roshan and give the edges to Phantom Assassin. They want to continue being aggressive, but Wings maintain a defensive posture. Particularly Queen of Pain and Puck are big nuisances as they cut creep waves to slow down MVP's push and apply constant map pressure. As soon as either of them manages to expose a tower, Wings can move in with the rest of their team and quickly destroy it. In the meantime, Drow Ranger purchases a Helm of the Dominator and a Dragon Lance. From here, she works towards a Hurricane Pike as an additional escape. On the other side, Phantom Assassin finishes her Desolator. MVP is out for blood. Wants to go in. Now they want to go for the high ground. The smoke is broken. There's the Dream Coil. The Gust on it too as well. Lots of damage coming out. There's the Golem on top. MP might fall first. QO. He's got the Aegis. Maybe he needs to worry about that second life. Now the Sonic Wave coming through as well. And they'll take down three. Blink gets a double, but Kyo, here he comes. Looking for Ice Ice. Gets the crit, but it's not enough damage to Kyo. He's getting kited. He can't do this on his own. And Faith Beyond comes in and finds another kill. What a terrible choke point for MVP to fight into. They're walking In an incredibly quick fight, Wings showcased their overwhelming damage output. Drow Ranger also revealed her newfound mobility. Due to Hurricane Pike, she can now escape from tricky situations and is much more capable of defending herself. Now feeling confident, the Radiants start applying pressure themselves. MVP try one more time to force the fight, but they come up short again. Going up against Drow Ranger strategies was incredibly difficult because they forced teams to tunnel vision. Both teams had the same goal, Drow Ranger. She either needed to die or to survive and the outcome of that coin flip likely decided the entire clash. Despite their best efforts, MVP just couldn't bring her down. Wings win another fight and then they take Roshan. Drow Ranger picks up the Aegis, then farms for a moment to finish up her Manta Star before the Radiant begins their own push. Over the next few fights, pay attention to just how much attack damage every hero on the Radiant does. Damage. Dubu misses the boulder smash. The Sonic Wave will go out and forever. Looks like he will fall first. Kyo jumps in. BKB from Blink and it looks like he'll back away. Dominating spree. Not sure how much the MVP want to go forward here, but they will. Kyo jumps in. Goes for the BKB. It is. It's barely alive. The Chaotic Offering keeping him up, but now Kyo jumps in with another Phantom Strike and will find the kill. Blink away from Blink of the Claw. Bebby. But he's Seven running. Race. I thought Kyo only knew one direction and that was forward. Kyo, wrong oh. way, buddy. Almost going down the Oracle ulti, keeping him alive. That falls promise, but Bebby will give his life for it. Kyo backing up into the base. They're going forward. Faith Beyond's in. He wants Dubu. Gets the waiting ripped off and one more right click. Gets the kill. The tornado is up. Wings are winning the longer the fights go on because MVP can't find quick kills. Another vacuum, but no wall. He's already used it. Gus will be off the target there. Swarm's able to dodge it, sidestep it nicely. They take the walking up. They're looking for Faith Beyond. He face shifts, but now Shadow Gust up. 
Cold Snap coming out. Look at how long Kyo is holding his VKB. He's gonna finally jump in, looking for Shadow, but there's the Hurricane Pike. Now the Kanek offering up for a Sonic Wave. See you later. MP will be able to force his way out. Kyo pops the BKB, but they can bring him down. Ice Ice, next up, stays alive. There's the Fortune 10, but Kyo now getting laid into the right click. He has paid some strikes away, but one more, and that'll do the job. Fortune yeah, going for the buildings. They're going for the tier three. They are going for oh, it's the Jungle over. Aramon. Wait to completely shut down MVP's aggression. The trade stops there here. Is. MVP are going to have to figure something else out. You knew the fight was going to be hard for them when PA spends his entire BKB trying to kill a Warlock who's already dropped Golem. Can't even get that kill. Wings just completely crushed MVP. QO could not stay. Drow Ranger was an incredible hero. MVP Phoenix tried their absolute hardest to shut her down. The approach of taking her safe lane tower early and restricting her farming space was the common counter strategy. But ultimately, it wasn't enough they still couldn't reach her. This was because of one of the many unique attributes Drow Ranger brought to the table. Her ability to support the offense of her team while playing entirely defensively herself. It didn't matter if Drow Ranger was hiding in her jungle, farming. Precision Aura was global. It still helped her team significantly. There is really no overstating just how strong Precision Aura actually was. Drow strats did enormous damage, no matter if it was early, mid, late or super late game. A single lost fight could mean a lost base. Dragonlance also had made Drow Ranger and other ranged heroes excellent at pushing towers, as with the item many of them were able to outrange them and destroy them from afar. Let's talk about her item and skill builds. Drow Ranger always skilled precision aura at level 1 as this gave her team a huge advantage in the laning stage. Frost arrows at level 2, then it varied a bit, although most players opted for one level of gust and the second level each of precision or on frost arrows before picking up marksmanship at level 6. It may come as a bit of a surprise that precision aura wasn't maxed out as quickly as possible, but the ability gained most of its power at level 1, and then scaled mildly from there, while a second point into frost arrows doubled the slow which opened up a lot of defensive and offensive opportunities. Precision Aura was still maxed out early, usually by level 8. From here players just leveled whatever was needed, sometimes even opting for bonus attributes over maxing out her other non-ultimate abilities. Her item build was more static, always an early core of Wraith Band into Power Dreads and a Dragon Lance. From here, Ring of Arcula, Yasha, Helm of the Dominator, Hurricane Pike and BKB were common choices. Afterwards, Maelstrom could be used to deal with summons or illusions and it also skyrocketed her farming speed, particularly when combined with Aghanim Scepter. Shadow Blade offered an additional escape and Hurricane Pike wasn't enough by itself. Drow Ranger had a wide range of items available to her that offered great flexibility while also scaling into the late game as many of them had powerful and expensive upgrades. This flexibility meant that even the heroes chosen to counter her weren't reliable enough because she could always buy the perfect items to deal with them. At the International 2016, Drow Ranger was one of the strongest, most dangerous and game-defining heroes in all of Dota 2. She was contested in 122 matches, over 76% of the tournament, and came out of those games with an incredible 58% win rate. While Drow Ranger was still a squishy hero that had to be extremely careful with her positioning, the new tools she had received offered her just enough survivability to escape most dire situations. Drow strats were more than just a household name. They had built a whole new house next door and moved in with a rowdy gang of weirdly right-clicking casters and supports. She had burst onto the scene and everybody had to pay attention. Hello friends, allow me to interrupt really quick, don't worry, we'll get back to the video in just a moment. But first, I wanted to ask you to give the video a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it so far. I mean, come on, you've watched so much of it already. Go ahead hit that thumbs up button, that really makes a genuine difference and helps our channel grow and helps us 
to continue to be able to make these videos. If you want to help us more directly though, you can do so by becoming a channel member. You can do that by clicking a button down there. Becoming a channel member will also earn you some benefits. For example, you can see the next video earlier than everybody else. Like the Draw Ranger video was available to channel members uh, a few weeks already. So if you want to see the Le Shrug video before we make it fully public, then you can do so by becoming a channel member. And of course, you get a bunch of other stuff. You get some bonus materials and... Most importantly, you support us because we do need that. <laughs> A channel like this doesn't just run on ad revenue, unfortunately. So we appreciate all of the support. It goes a really long way. So thank you very much for that. And now let's get back to the video. After TI6, Drow Ranger went through a series of nerfs. First, Gust had its cooldown increased. Then her base damage, strength gain and movement speed were all reduced. These changes hurt a lot, as they limited her survivability and laning potential significantly. 7.0 added talent trees to all heroes, and Drow Rangers was lackluster. She didn't gain anything particularly noteworthy, although at least they were usable enough to provide her with some additional minor survivability. However, Dragonlance had its bonus strength and agility reduced to 12 each, which also carried over to its upgrade and Hurricane Pike was made significantly more expensive, as well as having its cooldown increased by one second. Finally, shortly before TI7, Frost Arrow stopped being a unique attack modifier. In fact, most unique attack modifiers were declassified in 7.0. This was huge, of course, as she now could finally combine the ability with any items she wanted. Still, this wasn't quite enough to make up for the heavy nurse both the hero and her items had received. At the International 2017, Drow Ranger saw a drop in popularity, as her players had to adjust to her reduced survivability. Her role and playstyle remained the same as before, but the specifics of her build changed. While at TI6, Hurricane Pike was considered a strong option when needed, now it was mandatory, and it became such a foundational item for the hero, that sometimes players even opted for Force Staff first over Dragonlance, as the mobility was more important than the farming, fighting or pushing presence that Dragonlance provided. The most extreme example of this was Eternal Envy going Force Staff into Pipe of Insight, a purely defensive item that is usually bought by tanks or supports. Setting aside the creative solutions, Shadowblade became a core item alongside Dragonlance and Hurricane Pike. The invisibility it offered provided Drow Ranger with an additional escape, and in that regard, she needed anything she could get. Some players even adjusted her skill build, maxing out Gust first to increase their defensive options. While this new defensive attitude severely limited her potential as a damage dealer herself, that ultimately wasn't a big problem, as she had many powerful heroes she could partner with that benefited greatly even from the lesser precision aura damage. Puck was one of the strongest choices due to its powerful disables and dexterity, and Zhao's favorite partner, Visage, who had been absent from TI6, was buffed going into TI7 and was seeing play again. Drow Ranger remained all about precision aura. The six additional starting damage it offered made the hero a worthwhile pick by itself. However, at TI7, Drow Ranger came with much more risk than she did a year ago. She was too fragile to be reliable, but as her offensive power hadn't been nerfed, she still saw frequent play, being contested in 55 games total. Unfortunately, her performance when picked wasn't up to her previous standards at a disappointing 44% win rate. Patch 7.07 .07 brought two environmental changes that were important to Drow Ranger. First, Pullman's shield was removed from Dota. Pullman's shield had always been the best item for melee heroes to deal with ranged attacks during the laning stage. While Drow Ranger had never used the item herself, as it was substantially weaker when carried by ranged heroes, it had always limited her ability to apply pressure early. Its removal made those 6 extra starting damage Drow Ranger provided even more powerful than before. 7.07 .07 also introduced perks, a somewhat forgotten mechanic that didn't stick around for all that long. Perks gave all heroes additional bonuses based on their primary attribute. Strength heroes gained status resistance, 
intelligence heroes gained magic resistance, and agility heroes gained bonus movement speed. These bonuses were meant to be on the lower side, with their numbers being fairly minimal, but Drow Ranger was the queen of agility. While marksmanship was active, she benefited greatly from the bonus movement speed, and as a lack of mobility had always been her biggest problem, perks became a significant boon to her. However, the first implementation of perks was quite lackluster and unpopular. This was mostly because every strength hero having free status resistance that quickly grew to silly amounts and then coupled with some items was a frustrating gameplay experience. Just a few months later in patch 7.13, perks saw a significant rework. Now all heroes gained all benefits from perks, regardless of their primary attribute, but the bonuses were amplified by 25% for their respective primary attribute. The strength perk was also changed to be magic resistance and the intelligence perk to be spell amp. The bonus movement speed from agility was also slightly nerfed but was actually increased when accounting for the 25% bonus for agility heroes. This was all a lot of words to say that Drow Ranger gained bonus movement speed that scaled with her agility, which was amazing for the hero and helped address her ongoing issue of being a vulnerable high priority target. It wasn't all good news though. Included in the item changes during the period between TI7 and TI8 were various changes to Hurricane Pike that resulted in its cooldown being nerfed from 15 seconds to 23 and its mana cost being increased from 25 to 100 and its health regeneration bonus being decreased. While these changes definitely nerfed the item, they luckily didn't hit the parts the Drow Ranger really cared about. Usually one cast of Hurricane Pike was all she needed in the fight anyway, making the increased cooldown inconsequential. She also didn't have mana problems, so the increased mana costs didn't come up frequently. Drow Ranger herself also received various changes. Her talent tree was reworked and made quite a bit better. Interestingly, she gained a plus 300 gust knockback distance talent at lower 15, which over the next few months was then buffed all the way to plus 550 knockback distance. If you were paying close attention, you may have noticed that this is a buffed version of one of her old level 25 talents. This talent turned Gust into an excellent defensive tool that easily bought Drow Ranger a ton of space when used and also made it one of the longest range silences in the entire game. However, it might have been a bit too strong of a disengagement tool as it pushed opponents so far away that they ended up outside of Drow Ranger's attack range. Looking at her other talents, we can see plus 20 marksmanship agility at level 20, which was a solid upgrade, and then the absolutely insane 50% cooldown reduction she could get at level 25. While you might have expected the plus 20% precision aura talent to be the primary choice, it was never picked. 50% cooldown reduction was simply way too good to pass up. With it, Precision Aura had less downtime than uptime on creeps. Gust was a near permanent silence, and all of her important items like BKB, Shadow Blade, and of course Hurricane Pike became incredibly spammable. Not only was the cooldown reduction strong with items she already liked, but it also opened up entirely new possibilities like Ethereal Blade or Lincoln Sphere. Precision Aura also saw some changes, having its early damage nerfed but peak damage increased. This meant that Drow Ranger no longer offered her legendary plus 6 starting damage and instead only plus 3. While this was clearly worse, it also wasn't bad. That early in the game, any tiny boost mattered and Drow Ranger could quickly get back to her old level of power by putting early points into the ability. Finally, among some other smaller changes, her base damage was buffed by 4. At the International 8, Drow Ranger reprised her role as the drumming engine of the Drow Strat playstyle. Her players took the lessons they learned from her previous weaker incarnation and incorporated them into her new buffed self. They played more defensively and focused on farming. Ring of Arcula, Power Treads, Dragonlance, Shadowblade, Hurricane Bike, BKB. Her items had become predetermined. There was little variation to these core components. 
This setup allowed for fast farming as Dragonlance and Shadowblade let Drow Ranger move through the map while maintaining cover. For other heroes, this may not have been enough creep clearing by itself, but keep in mind that Drow Ranger had marksmanship, which already provided her with significant attack speed and damage. It wasn't unusual for Drow Rangers to be a rattle heard in the distance, showing herself for only brief moments before disappearing again. She needed to build her own strength to then power her team. Hurricane Pike and BKB rounded out the item set, providing the protection she needed to act in fights. Drow Ranger teams often played slowly. Their goal was to get to the mid to late game stages because then their team would start dealing overwhelming amounts of damage. Drow Ranger's new talents played a big factor in this, as the hero only became stronger as more time passed. The talent choice at level 10 was variable, but at level 15, as I already hinted at earlier, Drow Ranger never skilled the additional gust knockback talent, and instead her players opted for the bonus 25 attack speed. Level 20 was usually plus 20 marksmanship agility, and level 25 always 50% cooldown reduction. 50% cooldown reduction. This final talent was ridiculous. One of the most powerful tools to ever exist in Dota 2. That's because it didn't only affect her abilities, but her items as well. Hurricane Pie could now be used multiple times per fight. Shadowblade had a negative downtime duration, and BKB was available for every encounter. On top of her normal item choices, a whole new set of possibilities opened up. With the talent, Lincoln Sphere would block a targeted spell aimed at her or her allies every 6.5 seconds, and Manta Star allowed for a non-stop swarm of powerful marksmanship-boosted illusions. The most interesting item purchase came from OG, who bought a Feral Blade, an item that provided good stats, most notably the highest agility out of any item in the game, and that could be cast to shoot a projectile at a target that dealt damage to them based on the caster's primary attribute, as well as turning the target a Feral. That last effect is why up to this point Drow Ranger would never buy the item, as the Feral units couldn't be attacked. Still, because of marksmanship, Drow Ranger's primary attribute was extremely high. And with the 50% cooldown reduction talent, E-Blade only had a 10 second cooldown. OG had Anna running around with it, shooting anything in sight, dealing huge amounts of magical burst damage, and not really focusing on attacking. To maximize this strategy, Anna needed to maximize his agility. And what better way to do that than to buy another E-Blade. However, while Drow Ranger was now more powerful in the late game, she remained an exceptionally weak laner. She could use Frost Arrows to harass, but other than that, she had no way to defend herself. But Dota had shifted primarily to dual lanes, leaving the old style of passive tri lanes behind. This allowed for more aggressive play across the entire map and meant her team could make better use of precision aura during laning. Drow strats usually prioritized winning the lanes that she wasn't in, because winning the lane she occupied was incredibly difficult, and it was trivial to focus on the other lanes instead. Aside from laning, Drow Ranger also struggled against early aggressive roamers like Tiny or Bloodseeker, as they could limit her farming space to an extent that made acquiring the items she needed difficult. While this was definitely a problem for her, it wasn't insurmountable. For Precision Aura to be beneficial for her team, she didn't need to be involved in fights herself, which meant her crew could apply tower pressure or participate in counter ganks without feeling like they are playing at a disadvantage even if Drow Ranger was hiding in the jungle. Drow Ranger could also spam the active component of Precision Aura to apply it to allied creeps and apply significant tower pressure that way without needing to show herself. Once she made it past that initial hurdle of laning, she farmed quickly and enabled a well-constructed team to overwhelm even the most defensive lineups. The damage she provided meant that one tiny mistake often resulted in a lost base, as Drowstrats pushed buildings at ridiculous speeds. 
This was elevated even further by the fantastic selection of allies available to her at TI8. Enchantress and Viva were the top picks of the tournament, and Mirana, Ventral Spirit, and Storm Spirit weren't far behind. While some of her old partners had fallen off, there was no shortage of excellent pairings. At TI8, Draw Ranger was one of the best and most impactful heroes of the entire tournament. She saw white play being contested in 94 games and always had to be kept in mind during the drafting stage. Most notably, her win rate was an astounding 69%, by far the highest out of any of the top picks and one of the best performances of all time. Drow Ranger was a defining hero for this era of Dota. Across the last three years, her item build and playstyle have been continuously improved and refined, and she now held an ever-present spot in the minds of competitive Dota players everywhere. Following her outstanding performance at the International Aid, Drow Ranger received various smaller nerfs, which ended up mattering little, as patch 7.20 released in the November of 2018 included another rework of the hero. Precision Aura was changed to no longer provide bonus attack damage and instead provided bonus attack speed based on Drow Ranger's agility. Marksmanship was also reworked entirely and no longer provided bonus agility. It remained a passive ability, but now gave all of Drow Ranger's attacks a chance to turn into a piercing attack that ignored her target's armor and was guaranteed to hit. This piercing attack also instantly killed any creeps hit by it and could only trigger if there were no enemy heroes within a 400 unit radius around Drow Ranger. Up to this point, Drow Ranger had always had her identity closely tied to her large amounts of agility provided by marksmanship. 7.20 stripped her of this, as her ultimate no longer provided bonus agility, and she was left with nothing but her rather disappointing natural stat growth. As a result, for the new precision aura to have any kind of effect, it had to have its number significantly boosted, eventually ending up at twice its original value. Allow me to be blunt, this first implementation of marksmanship was awful. Its main advantage was the ability to one-shot creeps, which was quite useful as it could trigger on jungle creeps, including ancient creeps. This made it an impressive farming tool, especially when combined with her split-shotting Aghanim Scepter upgrade. However, it didn't really do anything outside of that. While True Strike and Armor Piercing are useful properties to have, that's not enough for an entire ultimate, especially since it only had a chance to trigger and wasn't active for every attack. Keep in mind that Draw Ranger was a very weak laner with little utility and now with less damage as Precision Aura didn't increase her damage anymore. Let's say that despite those odds, you, you listening right now, drafted her and have managed to struggle your way to level 6. Whereas other heroes get access to massive teamfight winning AoEs or incredibly powerful single target spells that guarantee a kill, you get a conditional 20% chance to pierce armor and true strike that doesn't matter because it's too early in the game for evasion. This would have been mediocre for a regular ability, never mind an ultimate. It seems that Valve agreed, and not too long after the rework, Marksmanship was given 120 bonus damage whenever it triggered. 120 bonus damage at level 6 was quite substantial, and so it made the ability at least somewhat palatable. Across the next few patches, Marksmanship saw a few more changes, notably starting with 7.22. It no longer instantly killed Ancient Creeps, and no longer pierced all armor and only base armor instead. Importantly, Drow Ranger had both her agility gain per level and her starting agility significantly increased, so at the very least she was on par with an average agility hero. Among some other minor changes, Drow Ranger's level 15 talents were also reworked. The Gust knockback distant talent was replaced and now made Gust blind targets hit by it for a 40% mischance. Unfortunately for it, the other talent was changed from plus 25 attack speed to plus 14 agility, and Drow Ranger really liked agility. On a wider game basis, quite a few changes were relevant to Drow Ranger as well. 
Unfortunately, one of her favorite items, Ring of Aquila, was removed, as it had become a ubiquitous item purchased by anyone, no matter if they were an agility hero or not. Aghanim's Scepter was given an upgrade that let heroes consume it to gain its effect passively. This could be beneficial to Drow in late game scenarios, as her Aghanim Scepter effect was fairly good, but up to this point had taken up the item spot she had needed to become strong enough to properly use it. That's not to say that it didn't see any play, it was just hard to fit, and now that had become potentially easier. Overall, Drow Ranger found herself in a much weaker position after this patch period. However, as we had seen before, her performance largely depended on how reliable it was to get use out of Precision Aura, and that remained to be seen as the International 9 rolled around. At the International 9, Drow Ranger continued her role as a Position 1 carry that enabled other ranged heroes on her team through Precision Aura. While the core strategy remained unchanged, its execution had become notably more difficult. Most obviously, Drow Ranger didn't really have much agility anymore, which inherently made Precision Aura less effective. To combat this, her players now purchased excessive amounts of early Wraith Bands. At the time, Wraith Band offered solid stats, including agility and bonus attack speed, for only 515 gold. It was a very cost-effective item, and lots of heroes opted for one to fill up their inventory during the early stages of a match. Drow Ranger players bought three to four of them. They were desperate for agility, and this was the fastest way to build up a strong base of it. From here, Power Treads and Hurricane Pikes were a given, but then players already needed to start selling the Wraith Bands to make inventory space. Wraith Band was a cost-effective item, but not if it was sold immediately and half the investment was lost. BKB was still mandatory, but their new need for agility pushed players away from Shadowblade and instead towards an early butterfly. This then resurfaced many of the survivability issues Drow Ranger used to have in teamfights. Still, due to these adjustments, players were able to supply the team with a significant attack speed boost via Precision Aura. Unfortunately, attack speed is much worse than damage. This is a bit of a blanket statement, so forgive me for generalizing. But in this circumstance, it is mostly true. Let's visualize the problem with an example. Say we have this tiny here, and he attacks once every 2 seconds for 1000 damage. On the other hand, we have this Marcy that attacks 5 times a second for 100 damage. Both heroes deal 500 damage per second, but there's a significant difference between the two. Tiny gets to attack once, and then has 2 seconds during which he can move, he can cast spells, he can make a cup of tea. On the other hand, Marcy needs to be constantly attacking, as any 0.2 second interval she misses, she loses out on damage. This gives her very little time to do other things. That's not to say that Marcy's way of dealing damage is always worse. She does synergize better with certain attack modifiers like Monkey King Bar or Skull Basher. However, if you recall, the heroes that worked best with Drow Ranger in the past were characters like Puck, Queen of Pain or Storm Spirit, all of which have lots of things they want to do other than attacking. Puck worked so well on Drow Strats because in between all of its face shifting and illusory orbing and casting hexes and yules and blinks, Pucks could find the time to get a few attacks in, and with Drow Ranger, those hurt. With the new Precision Aura, Puck would have had to dedicate time to attacking to get the same value or purchase attack based items, and at that point the effort required is too high to be worth the payoff. While the new Precision Aura may not seem that different, it was a much worse, more limited ability. Drow Ranger's list of effective partners had shrunk significantly. She now worked best with ranged attack based heroes that did a lot of damage but had low attack speed and usually wouldn't have the luxury of fitting attack speed based items into their item build. Examples would be Enchantress or Templar Assassin. This was extremely restrictive and mostly redundant as those heroes already did a lot of damage and didn't really need the assistance. Further, Remember how 6 extra starting damage from Precision Aura was somewhat game-breaking? 
the 6 extra starting attack speed it had been replaced by was completely useless. As during laning, nobody would ever want to just sit there attacking to maximize the value they get out of their improved attack rate. Setting all that aside, the worst part was that Drow Ranger herself simply didn't do much damage anymore. She no longer had huge bonus agility offering her damage and she also no longer had bonus damage that scaled with agility. If an attack from Drow Ranger didn't trigger marksmanship, she might as well not have launched it. In much the same way that Drow Ranger took the Dota world by storm at the International 6, she was swept away by the wind at TI9. She only saw play in 3 games and lost all of them. Her performance was lackluster and the teams that picked her would have been better off choosing a different hero. What had made her unique and powerful had been torn away and replaced with a shell of its former self. In November 2019, patch 7.23 was released and with it, Precision Aura was removed from the game. In my opinion, this was a real shame. While I will concede that playing Drow Ranger was not the most exciting experience due to her passive nature, this ability alone created an entire archetype of gameplay that shaped three years of competitive Dota 2. It was one of the most unique abilities and it made Dota a more complex and interesting game. In its place, Drow Ranger gained Multishot. Multishot was a channeled ability that had Drow Ranger release three waves of arrows. Enemy units hit by a wave of arrows would take damage based on Drow Ranger's base attack damage and have frost arrows applied to them. The same unit could be hit multiple times but only once by each wave. Finally, the travel distance of the arrows was twice Drow Ranger's attack range, which worked well with her favorite item, Dragonlance, as it would also increase Multishot's maximum distance. While Multishot was in many ways similar to attacking, the ability did not cause Drow Ranger to attack. This meant that additional modifiers like for example Lifesteal or Critical Strike could not proc off of Multishot arrows. Multishot's damage also scaled exclusively with base damage, or in other words, with agility. This wasn't a big problem though, as Marksmanship gained a new property. It now provided an aura in a 1200 radius that increased Drow Ranger's and nearby ranged heroes agility by a percentage of Drow Ranger's agility. For Drow Ranger herself, this meant that she effectively got more agility per agility. This was a powerful property, and because of that, Marksmanship also received some nerfs. Its proc damage was significantly reduced and it no longer instantly killed creeps, heavily nerfing Drow Ranger's farming speed. Multishot took over as her primary farming ability, as it easily cleared creep waves with a single cast. The final ability to gain new properties was Frost Arrows, now slightly enhancing the damage of each attack. Over the next two years leading up to TI-10, both Multishot and Marksmanship went through a multitude of number changes until they ended up at this point. Her talents were also reworked multiple times, eventually ending here. Unfortunately for her, the 50% cooldown reduction talent had been removed. Many of her new talents focused on Multishot and were quite good at bolstering its already solid damage even further. In late 2020, Aghanim's Shard was added into Dota 2. Drow Rangers upgraded Frost Arrows to apply a stacking Hypothermia debuff that reduced the target's healing and regeneration by 10% per stack up to 7 maximum stacks. Aghanim's Shard also enhanced Frost Arrow's bonus damage by 5 per stack of Hypothermia on the target. Should the target die while affected by the debuff, they would explode and deal damage to any nearby enemy units based on the number of hypothermia stacks they had. While the original implementation of this effect only applied to heroes, soon after it would be extended to work on creeps as well, making it a powerful farming tool. The only problem was that it came online a bit late, as Aghanim's shard could only be purchased after 20 minutes of game time. Aside from direct changes, there were also many adjustments to Dota as a whole that Drow Ranger cared about. Perks were removed from the game, which meant Drow Ranger no longer gained bonus movement speed from agility. Swift Blink was added and provided a new powerful late game high agility option. Heroes could now level up to level 30 and gained additional attribute points along the way. 
This made all heroes tankier at higher levels, which in turn made marksmanship more valuable to pierce through the additional armor. Finally, neutral items were added. These were minor items that could be dropped in the jungle from neutral creeps and provided fairly generic benefits. Because they were intended to be usable by a wide range of heroes, they often provided bonus attributes, and that in turn meant they were usually pretty good for Drow Ranger, as that was still something she cared about. The International 10 Lower Bracket Semi Finals Team Spirit vs. Invictus Gaming Game 2 Drow Ranger is picked by Team Spirit as their safe lane carry. On her team are Disruptor, Dragon Knight, Snapfire, and Doom. Out of all these heroes, the only one that can use the additional agility Drow Ranger provides via her new marksmanship aura is Dragon Knight. And even he doesn't benefit much since he's more of a frontline disabler than a physical DPS. This is not a Drow Strat. This is a team using Drow Ranger as a carry. Yatoro starts the game off on a bad foot as it only takes a minute before he's caught out by Earthshaker and killed. Drow Ranger remains a vulnerable hero that needs to be protected during the early stages of the game. Because of this, she's got a disruptor with her who excels at keeping enemies away. Unfortunately, that's still not enough, and Yatoro takes a second death before 5 minutes pass. By 7 minutes, he's completely forced out of the lane and the bottom tower falls. Drow Ranger finds herself stranded. This is where Multishot becomes a blessing. Even this early in the game, it's a fantastic creep clearing ability. And soon, Yatoro reaches level 6. Along the way, he invested the usual 2 points into Frost Arrows, the value point into Gust, and is now maxing out Multi Shot. He has finished up Power Treads and is working towards a Dragon Lance while farming anywhere he can safely find creeps. Currently, he has to rely on his team to buy him space, as he's not strong enough to fight. Luckily, TI-10 was a low-action farming meta, and so the Dire doesn't apply too much pressure. Maxing out Multishot as early as possible gives Yatoro the ability to quickly and safely move from lane to lane as he can burst down creep waves from a significant distance away, especially now that he's finished up Dragonlance, further enhancing the ability's range. The first Roshan Clash at 18 minutes shows us Drow Ranger's new fighting style. Keep the longest distance possible at all times, and maximize how many targets or the value of the targets that Multishot will be used on, as at this stage the ability still has a long cooldown and is only available once per fight. While Drowanger had already always aimed to be at the outskirts of fights, that also meant that she often struggled to actually connect with her attacks. Fighting at the maximum possible distance also meant that her opponents were only one or two steps away from being out of range. Multishot really made the difference here. Due to its incredibly long travel distance, it could hit opponents as they were running away, and since it applied frost arrows, it slowed them down enough for Drow Ranger to catch up again. After securing Roshan, Yatoro continues farming. He finishes up a Silver Edge, which offers valuable damage in defensive utility, finds a lucky growth bow off the neutral creeps, which further enhances his attack range, and at level 15, he skills minus 8 seconds multi shot cooldown, which often allows for two multi shot casts per fight. Both teams continue farming, with Viatoro slowly but surely catching up to the rest of the cast. He's been behind all game due to his poor start, but as he gets more items and levels, marksmanship becomes more and more powerful. After all, a percentage based agility boost works best if there is significant agility to boost. At 29 minutes, Team Spirit takes the second Roshan, giving the free Aghanim Shout dropped to Drow Ranger. This accelerates Yatoro's farming even further, and he now clears out creep waves and jungle camps in an instant. Around this time, he also finishes his BKB. Next comes the Daedalus. Yatoro played an unusual item build in this game. It was more common to build stat based items like Saint Jint Yasha, Butterfly, and Ioskadi. However, his team was lacking a bit in damage, and I think he was banking on a bit of crit luck. Still, this build also left him fairly squishy, which shows at 35 minutes when he's easily taken down during a Faceless Void Chronosphere. Regardless of item builds, being caught out by big disables remained an issue that Drow Ranger struggled with. 
back to farming until the Roshan fights start again. At level 20, he gets the plus 28% multi-shot damage talent. Multi-shot was an incredibly powerful ability that scaled nicely into the late game, so prioritizing its upgrades was a common approach. After a few minutes of skirmishing, Team Spirit secures the third Roshan kill. It took a while, but finally, Yatoro takes the number one net worth position. He started in a horrible lane that was easily shut down, and he had no significant successes and fights afterwards, many of which he avoided entirely. Pure, honest farming. Drow Ranger had always been good at it, but now she was exceptional. Next up, Yatoro buys a Swift Blink, which provides significant agility and positioning capabilities. For his level 25 talent, he opts for the bonus marksmanship chance, further pushing his damage to the max. Then, a big fight. Spirit, they're taking a long path around with a smoke round. They have the vision on the high ground. Oh! Jump forward, Toronto Tokyo is looking for his target, but he gets caught over the head. Fly, fly! He's into the back line. He's got the chrono down as he's a He needs more damage. Four! Is he going to be able to take a throw? And he is. That's the ace. He's gone. A second chrono. Locks the third. The down. Evo is able to wrap him from the side. On to collapse. He goes. Collapse. We'll drop the two dooms, but collapse will fall. Static Storm controlling Flight Flight as Yatoro gets out of the second round of the Chronosphere. Over the wall, there they go. JT drops the Echo Slam, but they're all falling on ideas. And on to kill for Yatoro. He's down the game. a rampage for the Drill Ranger. Yatoro. What a recovery he's had this game. Such a tough beginning. But his carry performance, it's coming in hard. IG, they'll come in with three buybacks. To pick up some Yatoro's Rampage forced three buybacks out of IG, and that's all Team Spirit needs to go for the win. Good high They're in. They get the jump in onto the void. The dude gets shot down. They're foul fly by. Time lapse takes him out to the side. The Kaggle will save him. Jump off from Galaxy. He's going to compete in a commit. The kisses are coming out. Doom drops over towards the leader. They've lost. Fly, fly. They'll lose Kakado. And they'll get by the looks of it. They're going to lose more here, IG. JT's trying to run Oli as well, but Mira shoots him straight in the face. Triple kill once again for Yatoro. As three dead on IG, and none with buybacks at the ready. Fly Fly just getting jumped there, trying to hit the neutrals. And no, Team Spirit, they're looking to end the game here. They understand that there's no buyback coming from Fly Fly. They know indeed, they know it's on the timers. A Spirit, they're looking to close it up. JT's going to go in for one last try, but the jump's in for collapse straight over onto Emo. Toronto's are going to work. GG is called. Spirit knock on G out of the competition. Team Spirit is so get to keep on this incredible run that they're having. Drow strats, we're dead. The prerequisite ability didn't exist anymore. But this is no funeral for Drow Ranger. She had become a modern version of her primal self, a simple ranged attacker that cared about agility with a silence and a slow. And she was good at it. Frost Air was getting bonus damage mattered. The abilities had always had its uses, but because Drow needed to skill precision aura for damage, it had been forced into a lower priority. Now, Frost Air was, was the damage. Combined with its powerful slow and orb walking, Drow became a much more respectable laner. She was still not amazing at it, but she was also no longer completely helpless. Once she made it past laning, Multishot easily helped her catch up and farm and synergize perfectly with the marksmanship agility boost for powerful late game damage. This boost applying to nearby allied heroes only made it more difficult to enhance her team with it. But in the right circumstances, with the right partners, like for example Templar Assassin or Enchantress, it added up to significant damage. Still, this was now a secondary consideration and not usually the reason for picking Drow Ranger. Finally, we shouldn't neglect the armor-piercing properties of Marksmanship. It made her excellent against stat-based agility heroes that didn't usually buy raw armor like Medusa or Morphling. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough to make up for her still lackluster laning and unfortunate matchups against top picks like Tiny, Storm Spirit, and Viva that could easily close the distance between themselves and Drow Ranger to disable marksmanship. At TI10, Drow Ranger only saw play in four games and was banned for another three. She did win three of the matches she played and she did well in them. If I may offer my opinion, I believe Drow Ranger was a bit underrated. 
but she still had clear weaknesses, her damage output and farming speed were more than solid, and there was a slice of the meta that she performed great against. She definitely wasn't far away from viability. After TI-10, Drow Ranger received a series of smaller buffs and nerfs. Her base strength was reduced by 2, and Multishot had its range multiplier decreased to 1.75 and its level 20 bonus damage tile nerfed from 28% to 25%. However, in turn, she gained extra movement speed, more agility from marksmanship, a change to Gust that made it so that she now gained bonus movement speed for a few seconds after casting it, buffs to her talents, and increased damage on Multishot and Frost Arrows, as well as a slight mana cost reduction on Frost Arrows. Additionally, Hurricane Pike received a few minor buffs and Aghanim's Shard became available at 15 minutes as opposed to 20. And that's all it took. At the International 11, Drow Ranger became a premier position among carry, right alongside the strongest of the tournament. Her exceptional range and farming speed made it easy to fit her into many drafts, as even in a worst case scenario, she would always be able to keep up and farm which was ultimately the most important. She also excelled against a significant slice of the top hero picks. Morphling got absolutely destroyed by Drow Ranger's armor-piercing attacks, Slog hated getting silenced by Gust, and Frost Arrow's healing reduction was an excellent way of dealing with Lashrock. That last one was crucial. Lashrock was already considered strong going into TR11, but as the tournament progressed, all teams realized that the hero was even more powerful than anyone imagined. This was in large part due to Bloodstone being a silly item at the time that provided incredible spell lifesteal and mana restoration alongside solid stats. Lashrock often felt unkillable in fights because of the enormous healing that Bloodstone provided. Drow Ranger though had no problem turning off that healing. Her Aghanim's Shard negated up to 70% by itself and if she wanted, she could stack an Ios Guardi on top of that for an additional 35% healing reduction, which completely stopped the Shrug from restoring his health. Drow Ranger, having such a good matchup against the Shrug, skyrocketed her value. Healing reduction in general was very valuable, since other important heroes like Morphling and Pudge also relied on healing themselves. However, it was usually fairly difficult to come by. Drow Ranger had one of the strongest healing reduction effects for only 1400 gold and it doubled as a farming tool. All that made it really easy to justify picking her. That's not to say that the shard was a must buy item, it's just that when it was good, it was really good. But Drow Ranger was more than just her shard. TI-11 was heavily impacted by one of the most short-lived Dota items that stuck around for only 14 months, Wraith Pact. Wraith Pact was an upgrade to Vladimir's offering. It carried its lifesteal, armor and damage boosting aura and it had an active effect that summoned a small movable totem that applied a 30% damage reduction effect to all nearby enemies. A blanket 30% damage reduction was debilitating to most teams, but Drow Ranger was one of the few heroes that didn't really care about it because she had so much range that she could deal all of her damage while staying outside of the totem's AoE. Unfortunately, Drow Ranger wasn't flawless. She remained a vulnerable laner and she was quite weak if it came to dealing with the number one and number three most contested heroes of the tournament, Marcy and Primal Beast. Both had good tools to close the distance to her and then to disable her, which for Drow Ranger, more often than not, was a death sentence. This was also why her item build continued to include multiple early wraith bands and then went the classic defensive route of Dragonlance, Hurricane Pike, BKB. From here, she had quite a few options though, as Silver Edge, Manta Style, Ios Gadi, and Daedalus all represented powerful choices for the right situation. While this selection of items turned her into a powerful attacker, they also didn't offer all that much agility to be boosted and shared with marksmanship. The aura aspect of Drow Ranger went largely ignored. Her four most common hero pairings were all melees. The bonus agility provided was powerful for the hero herself, but wasn't important past that point. Drow Ranger's purpose was not to support anybody else, but to rain down damage on her opponents, and she was good at it. Overall, Drow Ranger was contested in 88 games. 
This may not sound that high, but keep in mind that nearly all heroes that were played in more games than her were used in multiple roles. Draw Ranger, on the other hand, was used exclusively as a position 1 carry, and if we only consider those, she was a top 4 pick, being very, very close to Shadow Fiend and Pudge above her. This is all a roundabout way of saying that Draw Ranger was considered very strong. Despite this, she only had a 43% win rate. Not great, but within reasonable deviation. It's worth pointing out here that most of her losses came from teams that only played her once or twice. Every team but one that used her in three or more matches had a positive win rate with the hero. Drow Ranger was just good. She had become the perfect form of that poor range creep from 11 years ago. Drow Ranger started from humble beginnings. When she was first added to Dota 2, all she had to her name were abilities scoured from random Warcraft 3 heroes, stitched together into a package that couldn't do anything. She had no utility and dealt little damage. It wasn't long until Valve took action. They reworked three of her abilities, giving her a new identity as the potential centerpiece of a team-wide strategy. Unfortunately, that dream wasn't meant to be for another four years, as Drow Ranger couldn't defend herself in teamfights and crumbled to the slightest pressure. But then, Dragonlance and Hurricane Pike were added. These two items were tailor-made for Drow Ranger, and she instantly rose to prominence as one of the most dangerous heroes in the entire game, with an entire playstyle centered around herself. Drow Strats became a household name and shaped the way Pro Dota was played. Every team in every match during every draft always had to be conscious of the potential of it turning into a Drow game. The damage she provided to a carefully constructed team was unparalleled, all while also posing a significant threat herself. For the next three years, she excelled. Maybe even a bit too much. Reworks came again, and this time Valve tore away her identity. She was left as a hollow shell of her former self. Gasping for air, she reached into the past for what she had once been. Precision Aura was replaced with multi-shot, Frost Arrows boosted to match the modern pace of the game. It took her a moment to find herself, but then Drow Ranger returned to the competitive scene and rose to the top yet again. She was simpler, more streamlined, and yet a terror in the right moments. Her long range, high damage and healing reduction made her a menace if she managed to get the money she needed, and she had all the tools required to do so. One minute she's fifth in net worth, having lost her lane horribly. The next, she's bullying your base from 700 units away and you can't initiate because she has a 10,000 gold lead. Drow Ranger was never behind, she was just catching up. This applied not just to her games, but to her entire history. Across multiple years, she struggled to be relevant, trying to find a way to make her tools work. Draw Ranger wasn't important at all internationals, she wasn't an evergreen powerhouse. But once the stars aligned, she was nothing short of fantastic. Ultimately, the question of how good was Draw Ranger comes down to the old dilemma of consistency versus peak performance. We could focus on the years during which she was absent, during which she didn't appear in the competitive scene. However, I feel that she deserves better. Whenever Drow Ranger rose to the occasion, she left a lasting impact. In my opinion, Drow Ranger was one of the most powerful and influential carries of all time. Thank you very much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. We certainly enjoyed making it. Drow Ranger is such an exciting character because while she is a bit of an unassuming hero, she's been crucially important to a very significant portion of Dota's history. Now, honestly, my favorite set of tournaments right there. I personally love TI7 in particular. I, that's always the tournament I recommend that everybody go rewatch. TI7 is so, so good. Uh, but yeah, Drow Ranger has just been 
a very impactful hero in her very own unique way. And I think that's cool. That's super fun. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to become a YouTube channel member. You can see the next videos early. Next up, we've got Lashrock, the king of Dota. Lashrock, truly one of the greatest of all time. A hero that is so good. I honestly couldn't believe it. <laughs> but anyway. And then, of course, another thank you to our sponsor for today, Raid Shadow Legends. Go check them out. There's a link down in the description. They're definitely taking a chance on a new YouTube channel like ours. So we very much appreciate it. And uh, we, we, do, we do need that assistance. So, you know, go give them a look. We would definitely appreciate that. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And we will see you for the next one.